So I'll start with the introductions while people are filing in. I think, can you all hear me and is it not overpoweringly destructive to your ears? I, I have that effect sometimes. Okay. That's good. Um, uh, my name's Bob Beck. Uh, I work on OpenBSC. Uh, I made a tragic mistake about 25-ish years ago of having a Spark Station 1 Plus that I needed to get working for a project and I did not have SunOS. I booted NetBSD on it, or I tried to boot NetBSD on it, and, and that didn't work very well. Uh, and then there was this weird OpenBSD thing, and it booted and worked. And it said to set, call this pizza place in Calgary, and I live in Edmonton, which is three hours north. And I called the pizza place in Calgary to send this person a pizza, and the pizza place in Calgary would not accept a pizza order from Edmonton. So I mailed, them, mailed the person and complained. That had had negative repercussions on my life ever since. Um, that person was Theo. Uh, anyway, um, so I've been involved in uh, OpenBSD for quite some time. Uh, this talk is actually about a new system call we added just before OpenBSD 6.4, and we've been evolving it, uh, and it's called Unveil. And uh, what is it? So I'm going to talk about what it is. I'm going to talk about how it went in. I'm going to show how it's used. And I'm going to go a little bit about how we've, we've changed it over the last couple of releases. And I think it's probably now getting close to where it's mature. There's still a few things that we'd like to change. But in short, Unveil is to unveil parts of a restricted file system view. You call Unveil, you give it a path, and you give it permissions. The permissions are a simple RWXC, so they look kind of like <laughs> fopen, but they're not. They're still read, write, execute, and create. So when you say unveil, you say, hey, at this path and anything below it, I want to be able to read, write, execute, and create files. Okay. Uh, the first call to unveil restricts the entire file system view. So if you call unveil on slash home slash back slash downloads, okay, RWXC, from that point on, that's the only part of the file system that your program may see. Uh, if you call unveil again, you can open up more stuff. And then final call to unveil null null means your process will not be allowed to unveil anymore. The other option you have is because it is integrated with Pledge in OpenBSD, which is, well, we're going to talk about Pledge a little bit in this talk too. Um, there is a special Pledge for unveil. And if you drop the unveil Pledge, well, if you try to unveil, you're just going to get shot. The kernel is going to, to shoot you and you're going to die. Okay? Um, but the intention here is not to let your program die. The intention here is just future calls to unveil will not work. They will return a perm at that point. So that's the short view of how it works. And now we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about why is this useful and why did we do it? Well, why did we do it? It was OpenBSD inventing things. Some of these basement ideas that people just don't like. Um, that is a somewhat mostly unretouched photo of me developing a basement. It's actually Theo's basement, and it's actually Theo's sewer line. Um, uh, anyway, file system sandboxing is not new. Um, Chirrut is, would be probably the first example of this that we all know and love. Um, the problem with Chirrut is everything has to be in there. And sometimes that's a little challenging to make it work well. And there's lots of others, uh, and they're usually externally set over the lifetime of the program. So that includes the startup phases of the program. So if you know anything about OpenBSD Pledge, we've been taking a little bit of a different approach to restricting programs and sandboxing and, or jailing or other such things that you might call that. And it's not to say that other approaches are, are necessarily bad, but this is what we've taken to try to make sure that we can have this applied to as many programs as possible in our tree. Okay? And what this is more of an approach of the programmer decides this. So the trouble that you have often, and, and as someone who's occasionally written SE Linux policies, <laughs> um, you have to actually take this program that possibly has a lot of libraries it uses. These libraries are kitchen sinks of functionality that do everything. And so in order for your program to start up, it needs access to an awful lot of things to initialize these libraries, to call things, possibly to read a configuration file, open a socket, make something happen on the internet, all sorts of things in the startup phase. And then your program might drop into a phase where, if it's a daemon, 
Now it's actually reading requests and taking untrusted input. But I still, because I am trying to sandbox this program and restrict it externally, it still had to have access to all of that stuff it needed at startup time, during its startup phase. Now what we found is that in an awful lot of cases, not all of them, but in an awful lot of cases, this stuff is something that the program didn't need for its entire lifetime. And if the programmer, who understands the code, and can put it in the code, can make simple, easy to understand calls to effectively drop what the program is allowed to do at certain points, this makes it, it, it it's more effective and you end up, in the phase where the program is actually interacting with things, it actually has less privilege, which we like. So, often, you, so, and really it comes down to, also, do users of a program know all the corner cases? And trust me, as someone who's written as Linux policies, I have a heck of a time figuring out what some of the corner cases are on large programs and what magic I have to feed SE Linux to make the program work and yet have any kind of meaningful restrictions on it. Or when it gets into an error case, not blow up because it's violating an SE Linux policy because it now in the error case needed something that I didn't give it. So, the idea here, as with Fledge, is to let the programmer sandbox themselves. Okay, startup and configuration programs often require a lot more access than when you're doing actual work. And we really want the programmer to be able to choose when to restrict the file system. So, hey, I might need to start up and access a whole bunch of things, and now I don't need them anymore. Okay, and so the goal is really to have tighter restrictions on the important parts of the program. So it's a little different from Cheroot, and it's quite a bit different from external methods, because you have to change the code. Which, it's not a big change, but you do need to, of course, change it in the code. So, it is for developers during program development. It isn't a wrapper to be applied afterwards. And like Pledge, it does the, I'm, I'm going to manipulate my own future runtime. I promise from this point on, this is all I need. Okay. So, this got really, really tricky. Because the semantics of this were uh, effectively a compromise between a couple of things. We wanted as close to order one behavior in the kernel for the worst case lookup, <coughs> which is looking up stuff, uh, and semantics a programmer can understand. So the tricky part of this was this had to do, we needed to do a lot of um, stuff in the kernel to keep track of these and be able to do this efficiently. <coughs> because as you can probably imagine, what you have here is just a path. Hey, okay, it's a path, great. Um, I have a path, it's in the kernel. But the kernel isn't all that good at looking up paths, okay? Uh, the kernel doesn't work that way. The kernel works with vnodes in the intermediate layer of the file system. And effectively, what we had is we wanted it to be efficient in the commonly used case of file system lookup and not hurt other users of the system. So the, we had a couple of various fits and starts to this attempt. It started with, like, there was an unused argument to pledge that we were going to do this and pledge to restrict the file system at one point. And we kept having this issue that you would feed these paths into the kernel, and then my fun way to make this operating system run like crap for everybody is to pledge, would be to feed a whole bunch of paths into the kernel to restrict me, and then mean every time processes started looking up stuff, we had to we had to keep track of these bag of paths and incorporate them into the name I and do lots of string compares and good stuff in parts of the kernel where it didn't cost my process. My process was making the kernel do work that wasn't charged to me because it's in the low part of the kernel. Didn't want that. We wanted this to be as fast as possible where the work is done by the user's program, chargeable to the user's program, and not just done by the kernel where everybody pays the penalty. So, after a bunch of discarded designs, including making it part of Pledge, uh, we decided this needs to be a new system call. Okay? And what we settled on was a per-process structure that holds and remembers directory vnodes from the time of the unveil call. So if you unveil a non-directory, it actually does remember the name of the last component underneath the directory. And if you unveil the directory, it just remembers the vnode. Um, 
Directories may not, uh, so non-directories may be removed or recreated after unveil. And this is why we settled on, okay, we'll keep the name, hang it underneath the dnode, because the really, really common thing programs like to do is, hey, I know how the file system works. I'm a developer. I want to atomically replace something within the file system or update it. So I will write a new one and go flip, 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 move the file around. Of course, when you effectively do a relink, the vnode corresponds to that name changes. And we didn't want programs that do this to have to be punished if they want to say, hey, I want to unveil my config file. And somebody edits and replaces their config file atomically, so the vnode changes. But the directory vnode generally doesn't change. So in order to make it efficient, the compromise here is Directories may not be removed after you unveil them. So if I unveil Homebeck Downloads, and then I move Homebeck Downloads aside and make a new Homebeck Downloads, my program won't be able to find that anymore. Okay? And the idea here is to keep the lookup costs in the unveiling process as much as possible. And in fact, front load them at the time that unveil is called. So effectively, most of the work is done when you call unveil. And then you've just got a little cache of enodes hanging off here that when you do an AMI lookup, oh look, this is unveiled. We'll, we'll be good with that. So, the next issue that we ran into doing this is that <laughs> unveil is different than pledge. When we started doing pledge, oh hey, we've got pledge, 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 pledge. And the rule is simple. If you violate pledge, your program dies. So you don't have to worry about what happens after you're dead. <laughs> Uh, if you know the program is going to die, you don't have to worry that the program could do something stupid after you change behavior because of pledge. Unfortunately, um, Unveil makes the file system look differently to your program, and you're not killing it. You're actually saying this file either doesn't exist, or you don't have access to it. So I, I skipped it on the first slide, but the issue is that the Unveil will return a different thing from the file system. If you come up to a piece of the file system that has no unveil at all, it will say, that doesn't exist. You get enoint. If you unveil Homebeck downloads read, and you try to write to it, you'll get e-access. So it looks like permission to not. Okay. And so we figured out that we really needed that distinction early on. Initially, we just said, hey, make any violation return enoint. No, programs don't deal with that well. They do not deal with that well when they, they get something that they really do expect to be there, and uh, it isn't there, they don't get confused. So it's better to have the permission denied on the stuff where you're restricting what they can do. So, and this comes down to, if it's not dead, what happens? So, as I mentioned, there's a lot of nuances around libc files, per program known files. If you provide something by argv or configuration, you have to worry about file names just hard-coded into programs when unveiling. You have to worry about, well, do I want file names inside home? And then you get into the fun part of, well, symbolic links get followed. And if I make a symbolic link, what happens? Okay, how do I traverse symbolic links and end up somewhere I want to be? And as well, the ability to change working directory and walk up and down the tree. So if I'm, it's the difference between opening Homebeck downloads or if I'm in Homebeck, opening dot, 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 back downloads, etc., etc. Walking up and down with dot, dot is, is fun and entertaining to deal with. And we have to keep track of these and account for them in the kernel. So, how did this look? So, it, it, it evol it's evolved over the last release and a half, two releases. Um, we started with a few small programs in OpenBSD base, and there's some integration with Pledge, as I mentioned. Uh, if you pledge, if you drop the unveil pledge, uh, you can't call unveil anymore. Um, so any initial things, some of some, you know, need to just a really simple unveil or two right below pledge. So we have our own acne client. Um, in case you don't know what that is, that's for going out and using the acne protocol to get a certificate for your web server. Okay, this is integrated with a way to go out and ask Let's Encrypt to say, hey, Let's Encrypt, give me a certificate. And one of the things it does, so in the file processing portion of Acme Client, where it's actually able to scribble anything, because it is privilege separated, um, it will, right up the top, say, hey, I'm going to unveil CertDeer, RWC, and I'm going to, and 
Keep that going if it works. The cert dir is where it writes and creates certificates. And I'm also going to unveil the default CA file <laughs> that I use when I make TLS connections to Let's Encrypt so that I can validate their certificate. And that's really the only thing that Acme Client at that stage, after it's initialized, needs out of the file system. It only needs to be able to scribble in the places it writes certs, and it only needs to be able to read its, basically its root CA trust bundle. And you're done, okay? It can be used to restrict programs that aren't easily pledgeable, or further contain those that are. And, you know, just like pledge, it kind of makes privilege separation better, because if you have privilege separated process, they can have different unveils and they can have different pledges. So, if we think about user, okay, the user's command reads utemp and does a whole bunch of gross string parsing because utemp um, to find the users of the system. And so, what, you, what our, our, our unveil in that looks like, hey, unveil the path to the utemp file. If we pledge standard IO our path null, boom. So still, that bottom pledge, after that pledge, the program is only allowed to do read operations on the file system anyway. Okay? And if it tries to do a write operation, it's going to die. It also can't do any more unveils because unveil is not in that pledge. Okay? But if you actually look at that, uh, at that call, the unveil up top makes it more restricted because the pledge just says you can do any reads in the file system. The unveil says the only thing you're going to find is utemp. So if you happen to break into users and try to get users to read an SSH key, it's not going to do it. It won't exist. We could have unveiled null null if we weren't pledging. Yep? Uh, unveil null null is, oh, I'm done doing unveil. At that point, if your program makes a mistake or an attacker tries to make your program call unveil to open, because remember, op unveil opens things up. Um, at that point, unveil, it won't work. It will error. Your, your program has been permanently removed from being able to call unveil. It will return an error. Pledge is different. Pledge says, if I try to call unveil, the kernel is going to hit me with sig kill and I'm dead. Okay, there's a difference. A pledge is effectively a promise that, that if this happens, something really bad is wrong. And often we use pledge in OpenBSD, but there is time, there are programs that are unpledgeable because even all the pledges have certain restrictions that some programs just aren't allowed to do. So if you're writing a program that is mangling away with raw devices and doing really, really heinous things, Pledge just doesn't allow that anywhere. So maybe the program is just unpledgeable. First one we used this was ifconfig. It scribbles all over the kernel, but we don't want it to access the file system, so we just unveil null null. Yeah. <coughs> unveil null null and toast. So here's a less basic use. Um, we have our own version of NC. Uh, our version of NC does a lot of things like most versions of NC. Um, it's a network Swiss Army knife and has a lot of sharp blades, and it has alphabet soup command line args. Um, its command line args aren't quite full like LS, but it's getting close. Um, what you end up with with uh, NC, and so a whole variety of things it can do. And it's going, oh look, by the way, it's, it's kind of old and grotty, so the C flag is a path, K flag is a path. It's old. But anyway, we unveil all the things it needs depending on which options you are using. If it's talking over a Unix domain socket instead of over TCP, we unveil the socket. We allow it to do a bunch of things. And so there's a different unveil for each blade of the knife. Depending on how you're using NC, NC will be restricted differently. And that's not a bad thing because people sometimes talk to the internet with NC. Um, and just as an aside, but, but related, immediately following our, let's go full through and figure out what of the hundreds of modes, not hundreds, but dozens of modes we're using in, in uh, Netcat, um, and unveil appropriately. Immediately after that, we go through and, oh, and if it's this mode, pledge this way. 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 And so there's also a different pledge for each blade of the knife. Yeah? On the previous slide, you had an unveil with empty permissions, is that... That takes away everything. 
Oh, yeah. This basically says, hi, I'm calling Unveil, and you don't have any permissions on the file system. From Slashdown. So, we started this, and of course, yes? So, quick question about that point. If I'm on log, hmm? if I'm on log, how will that work? Isn't logging right into the file system? Yes, log will write to the file system, and you would not be able to log okay. at that point. So, basically, and, and NetCat doesn't do that. So, okay. so no logging. No, yeah, no, you would have no logging at that point. Yeah? Uh, logging is over the system call. Yes, true. Well, that's if they're calling syslog r. He's talking about if the program is actually writing to a file itself. Yes, you can do logging with a system call in OpenBSD. You can't do that necessarily somewhere else. And so a lot of portable programs out there still just open a descriptor and write to it. So, so anyway, the initial enthusiasm as we got this into the tree, developer go, developers all looked at programs and go, ooh, shiny, let's have a new toy. Unveil all the things. And uh, as I've mentioned, we're going to step back into how this is implemented in the kernel for a bit. Let's remember that we are caching vnodes and holding vnodes in every process that does an unveil to remember what you have unveiled. And vnodes in the kernel, while we have a lot of them, they are a finite resource. And you don't want to let user land programs consume all the vnodes in the kernel or really, really bad things happen, like your system just stops working. So uh, we have a limit. Uh, unveil can return e too big if you go over the limit in the kernel. And uh, so we immediately, it, it took, I think it took about a week before somebody decided they were going to unveil some program in base and, oh look, it passes files on argv. <laughs> Let's iterate through argv and unveil every argument to, <laughs> to oh, every argument that I give you on argv. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> but they rapidly, oh look, I hit E too big, what do I do? Don't do that. <laughs> if you actually need to unveil arbitrary files, you're probably using it wrong, or you should unveil a, 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 a top directory where you expect this to be worked with. Okay? Um, prior to 6.5, uh, in 6.4, uh, unveil was a little bit limited uh, because of the way it worked with name I. Uh, you had to actually cross an unveiled vnode in your name I lookup in order for it to take effect. This meant some things were a little bit awkward if what you wanted to do was you wanted to work way down in the bottom of a long or relative path and have the unveil up high. If you did an absolute path lookup, it always worked because name I would start at slash and traverse down. But if you did relative, once you got there, once you did relative path lookups, Things could get a little awkward, didn't work quite right. So this was fixed in OpenBSC 6.5, so we actually, at unveil time, keep a map of what all of your covering unveils are as you change them. Okay, And so we can always, in name I, know, oh, I got out of this unveil, where am I now? What is my covering unveil, and what permissions do I now have when I'm working in the file system at this level, as far as unveil is concerned? Um, one of the things that this made very useful is I can just decide in my program to do unveil slash r, um, which basically would say, hey, I'm, I'm done scribbling anything. Make sure that I can only read files, never write them, never create them, never execute files. I can't call it, I can't have anything work to call exec. Now, of course, you can also do that with pledge. So a lot of time in OpenBSD, we just do this with pledge but it's still a useful thing in programs that aren't pledged. So uh, the kernel implementation with vnodes is performing pretty well. We have good performance with it. And we have a bunch of programs in base that now use unveil. Some of these are, are pretty simple and stupid, uh, but a lot of them are less simple and stupid. Uh, Acme client is fairly involved um, and is you know, a fairly significant security exposure that we would like to not be a security exposure. Uh, HTTP <laughs> uses it, RelayD uses it, uh, a bunch of other interesting things that are, are all over there. SpamD, SpamLogD, SysLogD uses it. Uh, what have I missed that is new and recent? Anyway, 
they have been dribbling into the tree uh, as the feature has been committed and is and it's maturing and there's more to come so here's the important one it isn't useful for arbitrary file access and, and this is just one example um, the, one, one of the things that the Theo will now tilt a windmill at a, a few times and that is for example the Unix specification for TZ and term cap and all that stuff that old wonderful stuff that we use for terminal types actually allows in the spec for you to open an arbitrary term cap file because you might want to have a separate term cap file that isn't the system one um, and you know I can remember doing this back in the 80s to get my my big old Ann Arbor terminal to work right with Emacs because that was the bomb uh, and the VAX didn't have the right term cap entry. Uh, but <laughs> we're kind of past that, but this is still in the spec. So if you have any program that uses term or term cap, effectively if you try to pledge it, you're either going to break it because you can't specify a term cap and you have to be willing to live with that, or you effectively have to allow reading of arbitrary files. So, a similar thing that we often see where we decide, well, why are more programs using Unveil? Because they're using Pledge. So, to give you another example, uh, what was it? At. There's a few other things. Programs that go and they can possibly take a different configuration file on the command line. Hey, but I could potentially have that configuration file anywhere. So, now I have to potentially just say, oh, the user gave me arbitrary input, I'm going to unveil this arbitrary file and allow you to read it. It's still kind of useful, but then you look, oh wait, um, but I now immediately I read the configuration file and I drop our path from pledge, so I'm pledge standard IO. So if I was to read the file system anyway, I'm just going to get shocked. So there's no point in using unveil on those programs. It's, it's, it's a waste of time. So if you're already using pledge, to make sure that you don't have file system access anyway, there's no point in using Unveil. Okay? They are slightly different tools for this. But again, we still have these problems of there's some things that, you know, does this really need arbitrary file access in the modern age? And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we haven't unveiled programs that use this yet for that reason. So now we get to using programs outside of OpenBSD. This is where the fun starts. Because in case there, there was a, a running bet between me and Theo as we, we wailed on this and you were Ted was involved at some point. Semery was involved. A lot of people, as we kept iterating over this and trying another implementation, going, this sucks, throw it away, start over. This sucks, throw it away, start over. We knew we got it, we would have it right when we could do one useful thing. We all had this secret dream, um, and that's called Chrome. Okay, We wanted to be able to use this in Chrome, as you will see. So um, time of check versus time of use is normally avoided in OpenBSD. Uh, we have caveats in all of our man pages like this, which say, for the love of God, do not do the usual newbie thing of, I want to open a file. So, and I want that file to be read-write. So first I will call stat and see if the file is there. I will call access to see if I have read-write, and then I will open the file or create it. No, 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 no. This is a giant time of check versus time of use issue. And if you're doing it, you either A, don't need to do it because you could just call open and handle the error condition, or B, you're actually trying to make a decision about what you're going to do and you're introducing a possibly security impacting time of check versus time of use race into your program. So generally speaking, don't use these cults. Uh, unfortunately, software outside of OpenBSD base isn't always written to simply open what it wants and needs to. Glib from GTK, which is used by Chrome when built on Unix, expects to stop and access all the way down paths. So if you go, hey Chrome, set my downloads back to your home back downloads. This is what Chrome does. Chrome does, oh, well I'll stat slash, got to make sure slash is there. I got to call access on slash, and then I got to call stat on home, and then I got to call access on home, boom, 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 down the line. And finally, if I get to access home back downloads, I'll call open dear, read the directory, and give you a file dialog box. Thank you very much. Um, Chrome's behavior, though, in this case, 
really drove home the problem of exposing interesting program behavior. I had a bug where when I did this early on and the intermediate things, I would return enoint instead of eaccess on, on those stack paths. And as we were coming to various ways of how to deal with this in Unveil, um, if you return enoint for slash home to Chrome, it helpfully offers to create slash home for you. <laughs> so I vote we throw out all of this chef, all this puppet stuff, we just run Chrome as a cloud system provision. <laughs> It'll create home for you. Everything's awesome. Just trust the Googles. Okay, so yes, this sucked. What were we going to do about it? So the first thing we kind of did, well, actually, I'll tell you the first thing we did. The first thing we did is, and we're going to see this in a minute, we actually made Unveil remember all of the V nodes on all components of the path and add a little hidden permission, which we'll see in a minute, that users aren't allowed to set. But because I had these hidden V nodes remembered, I could allow stat and access to work. And so I actually allowed stat and access to work all the way down the path and get that fixed. But it sucked, because it means if I want home bet downloads as the only thing your program can get, that should be it. You shouldn't be able to stat that other stuff. Okay. I don't want you to be able to call access on that. I don't want you to be able to find information about the file system. So the answer was, fix the software that does this, upstream it. And I remember when I, I put the hack in, and Theo and Antoine and Rob, this was in Slovenia, I kept making Antoine, I would change the semantic of Unveil, and Antoine and Robert were sitting on the table with depressed looks on their face, rebuilding Chrome. <laughs> and rebuilding Chrome, and rebuilding Chrome. Um, and I, when, I, when they said they would fix this, I, I laughed and I said, you'll never do it. But, but they proved me wrong. Um, the solution is, of course, do the right thing. Just do the operation first, uh, try the open deer, and if that fails, oh, and you need to do magic for some reason, then you can go walk the path. It doesn't matter. But just try to open it first. Um, so with glib and Chrome, it was just make the directory, Walk it if necessary. And fascinatingly, this week, uh, glib accepted Robert's patches upstream. So it no longer does this. Yay! It does not do stat, access, stat, access, stat, access. Robert, unfortunately, isn't here. He was here for the hackathon. Antoine's here. He helped. Say thank you, Antoine. Thank you. Antoine. <laughs> <laughs> um, dconf also has this issue. Creates the conf it always tries to stat and create the config directory, even if you already have it. Just open it instead and deal with it if it fails. Um, so the changes increase performance. And the interesting thing, Robert told me, uh, now that you, if you have a reasonable path in your home directory, it's 110 less system calls to open a dialog box in Chrome with those changes. Uh, that's not insignificant. Um, this is cool. So with that, uh, we actually have Chrome and OpenBSD and Iridium on OpenBSD uses Unveil by default. So there are 5 million lines of attack surface in Chrome, and that's before it starts sucking in giant bags of JavaScript written by the Googles, trust us Googles. Um, and uh, you don't even know what JavaScript, where JavaScript's coming from. Uh, OpenB itself is including the kernel and Clang, and I say that because OpenBSD, when I run make build, is really a Clang build system. Uh, we, we spend most of our time just building Clang. Um, is 1.62 million lines of code. Chrome is about 5 million. Chrome on OpenBSD is unable to read your SSH directory. So no matter what escapes from your uh, JavaScript, if it tries to go in and read your SSH keys, it isn't going to get there. The only thing we let Chrome do on OpenBSD is look at, by default, you can turn it off, but by default, it can see the uploads directory and the downloads directory in your home directory. And so I always get used to, yeah, oh, I got to do some, oh, I got to see that, oh, okay, move the file into upload to go do it. Move the file, and it's really not that inconvenient. And I'd a whole lot rather do that than have some gigantish JavaScript mess trolling through my home directory looking for whatever is interesting. So we really like this. This makes me really happy. And, and, this, by the, and this was our holy grail of, we think we have Unveil right, if the ports guys can do this. And Robert did, and I'm exceedingly pleased with it. So, we talked about how we actually made it work at first. These intermediate hidden unveils, it's unveils a little dirty secret. 
Um, I actually don't hold the vNode just of the Homebeck downloads. What I actually do is I save the vNodes for each component of the path with a little flag, with a little permission called inspect. It's not one of read, write, execute, or create. There's also inspect. You just can't set it from userland. Okay? And inspect, uh, if I do this, slash can be inspected, home can be inspected, home back can be inspected, and home back downloads can be read, write, xc. Um, so as of OpenBSD 6.5, they had managed to upstream these patches to glib and were maintaining the patch. So we pulled out, prior to 6.5, we had the things you could do to an inspectable vNode were stat, access, and read link. More about read link in a minute. So stat and access, for this purpose, were I could stat and access any of these things even though I only wanted to be here. I couldn't do anything else with them, but I could get information in stat and access. So we took that out in 6.5 because we managed to get Chrome to a state that it didn't need it. And most of the programs we were trying to do this with in ports we're at a state where they did not need this stat and access behavior, and we could, we could upstream changes to stop doing that. So again, uh, thanks to the work of our intrepid porters, uh, lots of love for Robert and Antoine for working on this, because while the kernel stuff is interesting, they work with a giant toilet of software that is, is relatively hateful to look at. So thank you. Are you still keeping those other three V nodes that you don't need? I am, as of today, I'm still keeping them. They, we are still keeping them, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple of slides. Um, Six five still allows read link on inspect. Okay, so why do we need read link? There's actually no programs that need read link to do this, but we allow it anyway, and we allow it because uh, there's another thing in libc called real path, and real path will return you the resolved canonicalized path for any path in the file system. And our real path in OpenBSD is implemented by iterating through the path components and calling read link on each one so that if to figure out, because read link will return you enough information to figure out, is it a symbolic link? Do I need to follow it? Is it something else? Can I keep going? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So real path is just a libc thing that keeps calling read link over and over and over on a path, at least inside OpenBSD. So we said, hmm, that's, that's really interesting, but it actually then needs to walk down the entire path and do things. So in order to not break real path, we weren't in a state to try to fix this. 6.5 unveil actually still allows read link on all components of an unveiled path. You can't do a lot with just read link. You could see where a symbolic link points to, but we do consider this a bug. So, we don't want to allow read link on all components. We just want real path to work. So what we really want is a way to allow real path to our destination vNode without having to go look at every single component of the path to get there. So, you know, we could strike up a team, we could have a committee, talk to standards, or, well, we could just have another idea. <laughs> and, uh, so we had another idea. Um, that's me jackhammering Theo's basement. Um, and uh, another basement idea, which is make real path a system call. So hey, wait a minute. I, I've been spending the last few months digging and digging and digging in NameI and VFS Lookup. NameI already does all this stuff that real path is trying to do in userland. And not only that, I could do it with one system call instead of a system call for every component of the path. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So we added a little NI real path flag to name I, and we added a little option so that name I could, you could pass in the name I arg structure a place to save and return the path components of the canonicalized path that name I looked up. So uh, I actually committed that this week uh, at the hackathon. Um, so in kernel real path is in OpenBSD now. Um, and uh, I have the libc wrapper uh, that some people have. It's not yet committed because I don't want to screw people if their kernels are behind. So I'm going to wait till after BSD can and the hackathon fallout. And then I will commit the libc wrapper so that libc actually calls kernel real path instead of doing it in user land. Okay. But with that, uh, once real path no longer needs to call read link, on every path component, 
uh, and we'll move to that. So by 6.6, .6 we'll, we'll probably have this. Um, we will remove the ability for read link to be used on intermediate inspectable V nodes. And that will plug that up. Effectively, you have to have read access to do real path, and uh, that's fine. Um, it also has the nice side effect of being a little bit faster because, uh, and this is things like, remember, as I found out when I started looping the libc versions in, because I didn't think and I did it quickly before coffee, uh, the compiler calls real path. Um, when you screw up libc real path, <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, I did myself, okay. Um, but uh, the compiler calls real path a lot on, on include files. And so it does make things a little bit quicker, not a lot, just a teensy little bit, because instead of a system call for every single path component of the thing, it's real pathing, and more if you've got big sim links, it just does one, does the work in name I, and gets you the canonicalized path. So, what's left to do? Well, there's a few things. We can still leak information with Unveil today. So Unveil today, if you, once you get rid of the intermediate stuff, basically expects you to end up in a Vino that's yours. And of course, you still have to be able to you still have to be able to open home back downloads, even though you're only unveiled in downloads, right? You still have to be able to call open and traverse the names and name I and be able to get there. Well, traversing names in AI does things in, in name I does things like resolve dot and dot dot. And so right there, here is I could have unveil home back downloads because I'm Bob and I'm running Chrome on cbs.openbsd.org. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Maybe Theo has a directory here. If I've escaped my JavaScript, um, I can do stat home back downloads. I I'm somewhere I'm allowed to be, and I can do a path dot 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 back downloads. Hey, I started somewhere, I ended somewhere I'm allowed to be. But guess what? This exposed information to me that that directory exists because I was able to traverse through it in name I. I can't necessarily, I can't do anything to it, but I can figure out that it's there. If I went home back downloads dot 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 non-existent dot dot back, it would have failed with, e, with, with enoent when I tried to traverse that component. So this it's actually a way that you can still get information disclosure out of an unveiled thing. It's there, I traverse it, and we're gonna, we're gonna fix this in the future. And, and, and if you're thinking, the hint is, while I'm gonna make read link not look at an inspected V nodes, I'm probably going to keep those inspected V nodes and I'm going to call them traversed, and I'm only going to let you dot dot out of a V node that has been traversed. So if I only let you dot dot out of a V node that's been traversed, at that point, this doesn't work anymore. I'll go home back downloads, I'll go dot, 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 I'm good. I'm still on a VNode I've traversed, I'm basically at home. I go into Durat in name I, and then I realize dot, dot, hey, wait a minute, Durat's not, Durat's not visible. Oh, boom, you're dead, you know it. So, you just fail. So, so the future work that we have to do with this at OpenBSD 6.6. We'll finish kernel real path. I'll get the libc wrapper in. Once the libc wrapper's been in long enough, and we know that uh, bump the libc major, and get all the packages rebuilt so that uh, things aren't calling read link, read link, read link, read link anymore when they do real path. Uh, at that point, we'll remove the read link exception for path components. And then we'll probably also, as I kind of just hinted verbally, uh, restrict dot dot to not be usable outside of an unveiled path components. Um, later stuff that we are looking at um, that also kind of goes in flux with Pledge, because one of the things that both Pledge or Unveil don't do, they are inherited across fork, but as of today, they're not inherited across exec. Because the expectation is the programmer of the thing you exec has correctly pledged and unveiled the program. It would still be nice to be able to have these things work across exec in a limited way. And there's still much uh, arguing in the basement happening over how that should work with Pledge. And I think if we sort out how that worked with Pledge, the semantics that work for Unveil will probably follow. But as of today, they're not inherited across an exec. Yes? I guess that would be mostly useful for like a user uh, input? It, it, it's kind of useful for 
Uh, if I want to exec another program, but I want to make sure that program is restricted, effectively being able to use it as an external sandbox, kind of the exact thing I said we're not doing, <laughs> that's why it's hard. Uh, to be able to use this as an external sandbox to sandbox a program you didn't change the code for. And uh, we're, we're not trying to solve that problem yet, we're thinking about it. But it, it's very, very challenging as anybody who's worked with SE Linux, Capsicum, blah, 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 all the various and sundry ways to do this and system call restrictions and file system sandboxing and containerization, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's not a, we're not trying to solve that first. We want to have this right, happy with it, and move on and see if we can come up with looking at what everybody else has done and trying to learn from it and see if we can get a, a comfortable semantic that really is, the goal here is it has to be usable by mortals who know how to program. It, it has to be something that any developer can turn around and go, oh, that's not hard. I can put that in my program. It's three lines of code. It's easy. Okay. And, and if I'm not an open BSD, I just make sure I have a little macro that says unveil and pledge do nothing, and I don't care. <laughs> okay. Um, that's really kind of the goal here. And so the, the, the later on stuff is it's still in flux. And I think as we, we get a little more interested in how pledge can work across that, we'll, we'll probably make some progress there. Yeah. Are you seeing upstream allowing um, you know, accepting commits that have um, you know, macros that leave the pledge? Uh, I I think we have. We got any pledge users or unveils been upstreamed? I think there's a couple. There's a few. Much, yeah. It's starting. It's relatively new, but I mean, it's 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 really easy to, to leave it in there and take it out of programs. It's I mean, it's if you're not running on it's like hey, we're not open BSD. It, it does not. So, and you know. It could be ported to other operating systems. Pledge is probably a little bit more difficult because it's it's fairly involved. Unveil Unveil could be put into other things. It's you you need to be able to dig into the kernel in in NameI and BFS lookup. And I haven't looked at FreeBSD's version of that in years, but it's it's probably doable. It's it's not that different from ours. Some of the NameI and Namecache stuff's quite different, but so yeah. It could also exist on other operating systems. So, thank yous. Um, Theo, uh, countless arguments back and forth. Arguments with Theo are always entertaining. Um, user land unveils uh, and showing me, shoving me again in the Vino snake pit. You know you're in trouble when we look at this part of the kernel and Theo Durant goes, oh, that's dangerous. Shove, you go first. <laughs> it's like, oh God, how did I get here? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Semarie, uh, Sebastian Marie is one of our, our, our developers who likes to hide in France. Uh, he comes and goes, but he's an amazing code reviewer and has beat the crap out of my ideas for this repeatedly, including many of the repeated design attempts. And Robert Nagy and Antoine, who's here, uh, for unveiling Chrome and putting up with all the early API changes and upstreaming stuff to glib that makes stuff better for everybody. Thank you. And uh, Mark SB was my basement artist. Um, so thank yous. And uh, any questions? We're done. Ask me about basement development. Unretouched, this, by the way, that's my basement. <laughs> I believe Unveil is actually being worked on in that photo. <laughs> so, questions? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Unveil can be useful for programs where pledge is difficult to adopt. Can you there, 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 are, there are some things that Pledge just doesn't allow you to do at all. So you can't use Pledge on this program because this program is exceedingly privileged. Um, we just don't try to Pledge programs like that. We just try to get useful semantics to Pledge just to, to fix these corner cases, make Pledge worse. So, oh, I can't Pledge it. Oh, but I can unveil it. I can make sure that it, oh, it's doing all this crazy stuff, but it never needs to touch the file system. Good. Unveil slash done. Unveil slash read done. And then you know anything goofy that happens with this program, you're not worried about. So yeah. Are you thinking a lot about the RV problem that you described earlier? <laughs> Am I thinking a lot about the RV problem I described earlier? Yes. Um, Theo regularly reminds me that he doesn't like the limit. Uh, well he does like the limit and doesn't like the limit. Um, one of the things that, that is it would be interesting and, and actually I don't see if Chris, is Chris Dobbs here? Or maybe he's giving a, no, anyway. Uh, Chris Dobbs is working on OpenRSync for us. 
uh, and open rsync. What he would like to do is unveil in, in rsync, but un obviously rsync is a gigantor reptar sized list of files that blows across the unveil. Um, what he kind of needs is, is a mode where it's like, oh, I want to do all this stuff. Uh, hey, instead of e2big, walk up the vnode tree and start pruning them and just, just, just give me less, 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 and less, and less. So that can kind of be done in user land in your program to say, hey, I have a big bag of paths, find the common route, but that's inconvenient for the programmer. Um, maybe we'll do something like that. Uh, and yeah, I keep being, tr trust me, there's, there's a little, there's a little Theo-shaped Energizer bunny who keeps whining in my ear about this several times, and it, he's probably going to convince us to do something about it at some point. We won't change the limit, but we'll do. We'll try to do is provide a semantic that makes it easier for programmers to feed a bag of paths into it, and and you know get get a manageably upper bound contain. You know, oh yes, but they're all under you know they're all under var ww. And I didn't know that before I started, and I couldn't know that before I started, but now I do. So, hey, unveil a big bag of paths, and just unveil it read at the top level V node of this big bag of paths. Is there a way for the user space to take a look at a process and get a dump of what the current unveil limits are? Not directly. Uh, you, I don't have anything in there right now to say you are at X, Y, or Z. We could. Yeah, so, and yeah, there's been some thought of saying, oh, hey, where am I at? Right now it is go until you hit the limit, e too big, you know what you have. Um, part of that is because of those intermediate minodes. You might think, yeah, I, inter I unveiled three paths, but they were, you know, they were all 40 things long, and now you have, you know, three times 40 minodes being held in the kernel for your process. Um, limit's fairly big, but, but yeah, you know, you can, you, you can still run into it. Uh, the one place you can see for sure what you're hitting uh, is it, of course, has uh, um, the old thing of, oh, I did this with unveil, ktracer didn't happen. Um, it does tell you in ktrace exactly what it said and why. Okay. Peter? Um, in the path component for unveil, are you able to use blogs? No. Okay. No. And, and if you want me to implement shell blob or regex in the kernel, I, I will run screaming and, and, and consign you to the, the pits of the bad idea bears. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no. So, yeah, effectively, every unveil, effectively every unveil path ends in star because unveils are always applicable to the tree below it in the file system. So, really, the, the approach you take is, oh, I want, I want to unveil everything under my SSH directory read only. Great, do that. Just unveil the top directory. It's like, oh, I'm unveiling 300 files in this directory. No, just unveil the directory. One and nail, you're done. One we can. Yeah. So about term cap. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you like remove from the spec like that you could uh, accept arbitrary input, there's still four separate paths that it look up. Yeah. Looks up yeah. in order. Yeah. How would you feel about like instead of each application having to hard code those paths? adding in library functions to return Well, we, we cheat a little bit with Pledge. Pledge does that. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. Um, so for example, um, if, if you pledge uh, TTY, you, you have access to the files that you need for, oh, for right. term cap. Um, the other hidden dirty secret that I didn't talk about is certain things are allowed to bypass on bail, and that includes Pledge. Okay, Pledge is allowed to cheat. So then you would pledge TTY. Pledge TTY and, and move on with life. Yeah. There's a whitelist in the kernel of stuff that you're going to need no matter what. So. Yeah. Okay. In life. So there's things like, oh, I need to pledge DNS. Well, that means you need to get at resolve.conf and a bunch of crap. Good. Good for you. Okay. If you pledge DNS, we trust. That's equivalent to saying, yeah, I really need to get to the DNS files. Thank you very much. Yeah. For the Flutter text that wants the 300 files, I, I think if there's no non version, give me slash downloads, but only the files and slash downloads no. with no sub. No. No. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Just welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just what? Just welcome. Oh, okay. Diffs that assume they have they, diffs that assume the kernel has unlimited resources will be taunted. <laughs> <laughs>
Other questions? Thank you very much. Have five minutes of your time.